After six long years, the wait is finally over. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is out right now and it is incredible, but don't take my word for it. I would much rather hear from two of the minds that have created yet another masterpiece. Joining me from the other side of the world, series producer Mr. A.G. Aonuma and game director Mr. Hidemaro Fujibayashi. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Are you? Uh, I'm excellent, thank you. Probably because I've been playing a lot of your game. And uh, first of all, congratulations. Players around the world are quite literally diving back into Hyrule as we speak. So how does that feel? You don't have to keep it secrets anymore. Oh, we worked very hard on this title, so we're very excited to see how passionately it's going to be received worldwide by those that are playing it. Some of my friends have told me that they're going to take the day off to play the game. With that said, I hope that people try to take their time to go through it and don't rush through all at once. Uh, many of my friends are taking the day off too, and for good reason, I think. I mean, I absolutely loved Breath of the Wild, so I wanted to start by asking you, if that game was about breaking the conventions of Zelda, how would you describe The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom? Breath of the Wild was about breaking away from the convention and for Tears of the Kingdom we further expanded this element and made it more free. We wanted to make sure that people can realise and achieve whatever they could imagine. So in that sense, it is a true sequel to Breath of the Wild. We wanted to further expand on this aspect of freedom and to make sure that people can really create and make what they imagine. That creativity is huge. I bet we're going to see YouTube and TikTok videos for, for years of the crazy things people have created in, in the game. And as, as much as I love that freedom, I think I'm even happier that traditional dungeons are back as well. They're here in Tears of the Kingdom in addition to shrines. And so I have to ask, I mean, why were the temples so important to bring back? And did you hear that feedback from fans when you were deciding to make a sequel? Dungeon. In terms of the temples, the reason why we included these large temples this time around is because with Breath of the Wild, the theme was moving temples. That's why we had the divine beasts and they were rotating and moving. Whereas this time, the theme is making it seamless. We wanted fewer load times for each of these sections. So even when we had these large dungeons, we decided to make them a continuation of Link's path. When we're looking out at the temples as well, we wanted to make sure that the view was seamless and to make sure that we can utilize this new way of playing. And so more so than a return, using fire, wind, water and lightning elements was more fitting and we thought the most interesting way of expressing the game. In the classic, more traditional Zelda games, you'd obviously reach a temple, collect a new item and then use that item to solve puzzles and beat a boss. And in Tears of the Kingdom, it's sort of similar, but instead of collecting items, you collect companions and the puzzles start well before you even reach the temple itself, which I, re I found really interesting. So how long have you had that as an idea and why was Tears of the Kingdom the right place to try it? And do you have a favorite companion? My favorite is Yonabu. His destructiveness comes in very handy in certain scenes. Yeah, he's my favorite. As we came up with this scenario, it was something that sort of naturally came up. My favorite companion is Tulan. In the sense of past mystery solving in Zelda, these sort of aspects, them becoming companions, has always been present. Witness this new power I possess! It's always been you first figure out and learn about abilities or a function of a companion and then you go out to a more vast field and utilize these abilities and functions accordingly. This time with Sage's powers you sort of learn about the power itself and then once you get your companion you can go out and use these abilities and powers in certain ways to explore and discover further. Speaking of discovery, the story really does go some places I think fans will not be expecting. No spoilers, I haven't even finished the game myself yet, but why did you decide to separate Link from Zelda and use memories to tell a lot of her story again? For both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, the open air concept is the most important aspect of the game. And so when you try to sort of tell a story within this kind of open air system, like in Breath of the Wild, explaining it partially and providing parts through gameplay and other parts through the story, we thought is and was the most fitting way to express it. 
Of course, we can't really talk about the, the scenario or that story without talking about Ganondorf. And we haven't really seen him in human form, I suppose, since uh, Twilight Princess, which is almost 20 years ago now. Mr. Fujibayashi, I know you've directed a lot of Zelda games, but never one with Ganondorf in human form as the main villain, but you did write and direct Skyward Sword, which started the Zelda timeline with Demise. So did that at all factor into directing Tears of the Kingdom and how you handled Ganondorf as a character? Ganondorf is a very, very important character in the context of Legend of Zelda, and I've always been very, very careful in handling how and when he appears and how we portray him. In Breath of the Wild, Princess Zelda's story was one where she learned and realizes her potential, which grows as the story goes on. Whereas for Tears of the Kingdom, it's more of an opportunity for Zelda to think deeply about Hyrule Kingdom and Hyrule as a country. In order to depict this theme in Tears of the Kingdom, Ganondorf is also a king. It was something that couldn't be avoided. Using Ganondorf in human form was sort of inevitable in telling the story for Tears of the Kingdom. Survivors. Oh, Mr. Aonuma, Mr. Fujibayashi, thank you so much again. It truly is an honor to get this chance to speak to you before the release of uh, The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. And as a fan, I couldn't be happier. I think you've done an amazing job. So congratulations again. Thank you. Thank you. That was just the first half of my interview with these two legendary video game developers. The rest is up at 9news.com.au. We weren't allowed to film the final 20 minutes, but Mr. Fujibayashi spills the beans on one mechanic he's been able to bring to Tears of the Kingdom that he's wanted to put in a Zelda game as far back as Skyward Sword. <laughs> 